Hi everyone. So today we're going to be talking about ignorance and the different ways that the mind can be mistaken or wrong. We'll look at it from a few different views of subtlety. The reason we're looking at this is that ignorance underpins all of the mistakes in our life. It underpins all of the causes of suffering and the harm we give to ourselves and others. So I think it's really important to hear the philosophical systems while at the same time making it very personal and asking ourselves why do we make the unfortunate choices that we make and why do other people? And really look very deeply at how it boils down to a misunderstanding of self. But what is that misunderstanding specifically? Ignorance and Appearances According to Prasangikas, the view of a personal identity and ignorance both grasp their object as existing inherently. And for that reason, the view of a personal identity is a form of ignorance. First link ignorance is the view of personal identity. It is an innate self-grasping that has been present since beginningless time and gives rise to formative karma that projects a rebirth in cyclic existence. It is not an acquired self-grasping that is due to familiarity with incorrect philosophies, nor is it the mental factor of ignorance, which is much broader and includes ignorance regarding karma and its effects. Ignorance grasps the inherent existence of persons and phenomena, whereas the view of a personal identity grasps the inherent existence of only our own I and mine. All beings, except arhats, bodhisattvas, on the eighth ground or higher, and buddhas, have ignorance. But only ordinary beings, those below the path of seeing, have first link ignorance. Aryas of the three vehicles, who have not eradicated all afflictive obscurations, have ignorance. However, it is not strong enough to produce karma that projects a samsaric rebirth, and thus it is not first link ignorance. So, words to review here. Arhat means foe destroyer. Bodhisattva, someone who has achieved the Mahayana path of accumulation or higher. When it says eighth ground, it's referring to the path of meditation's ten grounds that end with the path of no more learning Buddhahood. Buddhahood, of course, is someone who's achieved complete enlightenment, including omniscience, has removed all suffering in its causes, as well as anything that obscures the mind from knowing. So ordinary beings refers to anyone who has not realized emptiness directly, meaning those below the path of seeing. Aryas refer to anyone who's realized emptiness directly, perceptually, whether it's Mahayana or someone of the other vehicles. When it says the three vehicles, it's referring to hearers, solitary realizers, and bodhisattvas. Hearers and solitary realizers, Shravakas and Pratyeka Buddhas, these two are of the Pali tradition or the Theravadan practices that lead to nirvana as opposed to full enlightenment. So here we're talking about the 12 links of dependent arising, the first link ignorance, which is what keeps samsara going and is the root of samsara. When they say the view of a personal identity, they're talking about a very specific type of ignorance or view. First link ignorance is the specific moments of ignorance grasping inherent existence and the view of a personal identity that lie behind the motivation. Performance and completion of a virtuous or non-virtuous karma, powerful enough to project rebirth in samsara.
So just a brief review of karma. Remember that it needs to have all branches complete. So the preparation, the action is done, the action is completed. So you thought about it, you were motivated to do it, there was an affliction present or a virtuous state of mind present. Then you actually did the thing you set out to do. And then afterwards you rejoice. You actually fulfilled what you set out to do. So it has to be very, very intentional for it to be strong enough to project a rebirth. You had to mean it. You had to have done it on purpose. Not other moments of ignorance or other types of ignorance that occur in our lives. In short, first link ignorance is the view of a personal identity that newly motivates that set of 12 links second branch, formative action, which is also called karmic formations, depicted by the potter making various sized pots. This ignorance actively grasps the self as existing in a way it does not. It is the root of samsara, the principal cause of rebirth in cyclic existence. So it's important to know the specific root of samsara, because otherwise we can't create the specific antidote to it, and thus ridding ourselves of suffering and its causes and all forms of harm to self and others. So from the Lamrim Chenmo, there's a quote. Knowing this, basically, you will thereby become certain from the depths of your heart that it is the reifying view of the perishing aggregates which acts as the root of cyclic existence. You then need to develop a sincere wish to eliminate that. So to say reifying means to make concrete or to make fixed a view of something that is perishing or transient or impermanent. The aggregates, of course, refer to the basis upon which we label I, form, feeling, recognition or discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness, meaning primary consciousness. So it's this view that's the problem. Vaibhashikas, the Great Exposition School, Sotrantikas, the Sutra School, Chittamatrans, the Mind Only School, and Svatantrikas, the Middle Way Autonomy School, say first link ignorance grasps a self sufficient, substantially existent person. This is the root of samsara that must be eliminated to attain liberation from their perspective. Chittamatrans and Svatantrikas also assert self-grasping of phenomena that must be eliminated in order to attain full awakening. They consider this to be the, quote, ultimate root of samsara. For Chittamatrans, the mind-only school, the ignorance grasping a self of phenomena that is the final root of samsara holds subjects and objects to be different entities and holds phenomena to exist by their own characteristics as the reference of their names. For Svatantrikas, the final root of samsara is the ignorance grasping the true existence of all phenomena. Prasangikas identify a subtler ignorance as the root of samsara the ignorance that grasps persons and phenomena to exist inherently. The view of a personal identity that grasps I and mine is preceded by and dependent on the ignorance grasping the aggregates as inherently existent. It's a subtle distinction, but just something to think about.
So then the root of samsara from how things exist from Lama Zopa Rinpoche, the thought that labels I, independence on the aggregates, is not the ignorance that is the root of samsara. When the I appears to us, it appears to have existence from its own side, the complete opposite to being merely labeled. The later continuation of the thought that labels I starts to believe that the I, which is labeled, has existence from its own side, or true existence. The mind to which the truly existent I appears is still not the root of samsara. The root of samsara is the thought that believes this truly existent I that appears to me is true. Whenever we start to believe that the truly existent I is true, this is the concept of true existence, and this is the root of samsara. So it's not just having the idea or the appearance of the I of being truly existent or inherently existent, which in this context are synonymous. It's the belief in it. And so we really want to unpack this belief because it's the belief even more than the appearance that is the issue. It's just that the belief and the appearance have come together so often from beginningless time that for us, we don't separate them. Lama Zopa continues, This thought that believes the I is not merely labeled, but has an existence from its own side, is the root of samsara. Just that thought that believes this to be true is the root of samsara. The wrong conceptions that believe the I to be permanent or to exist alone, or with its own freedom, without depending on the continuation of the aggregates, are not the root of samsara. So they're still wrong conceptions, but they're not at the heart of the problem. After the label I has been given, when the continuation of this thought starts to believe that the I has existence from its own side, this is the root of samsara. So after the label I has been given, when the continuation of this thought starts to believe that the I has existence from its own side, this is the root of samsara. So I know it's being repeated, but we really have to sit with the very subtle nuance of what this is. There's a continuous thought that is reinforcing an identity that isn't true. It's not accurate, but it seems so. What makes the I, which is merely imputed, appear truly existent? Our past ignorance left an imprint on our mental continuum, and this imprint is projected like a projector projecting a film onto a screen or TV channel, showing people fighting, dancing, or doing other things. The imprint left on our mental continuum by past, art, past ignorance projects or decorates true existence onto the merely imputed I. We see a concrete I, and that is what the imprint left by ignorance has projected onto the mere I. That part is a complete hallucination. So when it says imprint here, it's referring to karmic imprint. So this root of samsara is described in a lot of different ways, using a lot of different words, and is coming at it from many perspectives. This can be confusing, especially when the shorthand is to just say, ignorance is the root of samsara. And it's true, ignorance is the root of samsara, but it's a particular kind of ignorance and it involves a view that is mistaken. And it's important to look at the nuances of this because I think in your practice and in your work and in your life, there is a lot of um, area to look into in terms of your own identity and the way in which you reinforce things that aren't true or don't have to be true, but by believing that they are, prevents change or 
keeps shame going or keeps pride going. So looking at some of these synonyms for the root of samsara from the Middle Way Consequence School's view, I think looking at the different translation choices and the different ways of phrasing it can help us kind of unpack and get to a deeper meaning. So the view of the transitory collection, the reifying view of the perishing aggregates, the view of a personal identity that is preceded by grasping at the aggregate slash phenomena, viewing the I in one's own mental continuum and holding it to exist inherently, dot 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 plus, knowing that there are things that precede that, and the innate self-grasping ignorance that is the root of samsara. So these are all synonyms that you'll find, and we say innate self-grasping ignorance specifically because the term self-grasping and ignorance themselves are broader categories that sometimes refer to the root of samsara and sometimes don't. So context is really key. So now we'll shift gears and look a little bit more into conventional truth and the different mistakes just on a relative level. From Insight into Emptiness by Kenser Jumpa Techok, the distinction can be made between things that are real from a worldly perspective and things that are unreal from the worldly perspective. Worldly perspective or worldly consciousness here refers to a conventional valid cognizer not directed toward emptiness in the continuum of a worldly being. Worldly beings here are those who have not realized emptiness either inferentially or directly. Included among worldly beings are people who have not yet entered the path as well as people who have. What is the range of people who have not realized emptiness? Most people who have not entered the path have not realized emptiness even inferentially. So these terms inferential, direct, cognizer, these are all from the discussion of the seven types of awareness in Lorig that you did a few semesters ago. So if you need to review any of that, you can look at the Happy Monks publication, A Drop from the Ocean of Consciousness. Beings on the first path, the path of accumulation, have not necessarily realized emptiness, even inferentially, although some may have. The demarcation line for entering the path of preparation is the union of serenity, shine shamata calm abiding, and insight on emptiness, which is in this case an inferential realization of emptiness. So it's not yet perceptual, it's not yet direct. So those who have entered the path of preparation have realized emptiness inferentially. So just a quick review of the five paths. The path of accumulation, so-called because the emphasis is on accumulating merit. Path of preparation, so-called because the emphasis is on preparing to see emptiness directly. Path of seeing, so-called because one sees emptiness directly. Path of meditation, so-called because one meditates again and again on emptiness directly. And here is where we find the ten grounds or ten boomies. And the path of no more learning so-called because one has no more to learn as omniscience, full awakening, enlightenment has been achieved. This is Buddhahood. So gate gate paragate parasamgate bodhi refers to these five paths. The Prajna Paramita mantra, the mantra from the Heart Sutra that we say each week. And I think it's important to th remember also from your Buddha nature semester that the path of no more learning Buddhahood 
includes one having achieved all four Buddha bodies, the emanation body and the enjoyment body. These are the form bodies or the rupakayas, as well as the truth bodies, wisdom truth and nature truth bodies, which are the result of the realization of emptiness and the fact that the mind is by nature empty of inherent existence. So all four of these become completely actualized at this fifth path. So continuing on, what is the range of people who have realized emptiness? It is possible to realize emptiness inferentially before entering a path, and beings with sharp faculties often do this. They realize emptiness before generating unfabricated bodhicitta, which is the demarcation line for entering the Mahayana path of accumulation. In addition, the realization of emptiness may exist on all five paths, but only those on the path of seeing and above have the direct, non-conceptual realization of emptiness. A visual form is an example of something that is true from a worldly perspective. That is, from the perspective of the mind of a worldly being. Even though that visual form appears to that person to be truly existent, he is not able to realize that, at that point, that this visual form does not exist in the way that it appears. For him, that visual form exists truly as it appears, because he hasn't yet realized that it's empty of true existence. The appearance of two moons, when we stretch our eye, is an example of something that is unreal from the perspective of a worldly being. Another example is a white conch that appears yellow. In these cases, we know there is a disparity between the way of appearing and existing. We can realize that the appearance of some things is wrong, that they do not exist in the way that they appear, even before we realize emptiness. These things are unreal from a worldly perspective. Both ordinary people and Aryas have conventional valid cognizers that can distinguish reflections, mirages, and so forth as unreal. Real and unreal things are distinguished according to whether or not a worldly being is able to see that it does not exist as it appears. Here, does not exist as it appears does not mean that it appears truly existent, although it is not, rather that things are real or unreal from a worldly perspective, depending on whether someone who has not realized emptiness can see that they do not exist as they appear. Here, does not exist as it appears, refers to a mistaken way of appearing that even a conventional valid cognizer can know are mistaken. From the perspective of a person who has not realized emptiness, the table is considered real because it exists the way it appears to a worldly being who has not realized emptiness. That is, it appears as a table to this person and exists as a table. But what about the people and events that appear on a television screen? What about reflections in a mirror and mirages? Apart from perhaps a very young child, People who haven't realized emptiness can discern that they are unreal, that they do not exist as they appear. They know that people appear to be in the television, but that there are no people there. They know that the face in the mirror and water on the asphalt are only appearances and that nothing real is there. Although worldly beings know that people in the television, holograms, reflections, and mirages do not exist as they appear, does that mean that they have realized emptiness? Is realizing that things do not exist as they appear the same as realizing their emptiness of true existence? No, it isn't. Realizing that the face in the mirror is not a real face is a coarse, superficial way of knowing that things do not exist as they appear. 
To know this, realization of emptiness is not necessary. Realizing that phenomena do not exist truly, although they appear to, is a much deeper understanding. And to know this, one must have already realized emptiness, either inferentially or directly. There can be two mistaken appearances in relation to one object. In the simile of the mirage, its appearance as water is its coarse mistaken appearance, while its appearance as truly existent is its subtle mistaken appearance. Similarly, its non-existence as it appears could be on two levels. The mirage not existing as water as it appears is the coarse level. The mirage not existing from its own side is the subtle level. When we clearly realize the coarse level of its mistaken appearance, we come closer to understanding the subtle one, which is the actual meaning of the mirage simile. So here's that same passage again, and then just a video of a mirage. And the point here is that you see something, but you're completely aware that that's not the reality of it, simultaneously with seeing it. It would be easy to believe it if you didn't understand how mirages work, but we know better. To realize that the reflection in the mirror does not exist as an actual face, we have to realize that the reflection does not exist as it appears. That reflection has two appearances. Its appearance as a face, which is the coarse appearance, and its appearance as self-existent, which is its subtle appearance. When we realize the reflection is empty of existing as a face, as it appears, we realize it is empty of its coarse appearance. At that time, we have not even come close to negating its subtle, mistaken appearance. Its appearance is truly existent. When we realize the reflection is empty of true existence as it appears, we realize its subtle emptiness. So that's just another example but we're really looking at how we do have this ability to distinguish between things seeming a certain way visually, things seeming a certain way at first, but us not buying into it, us not thinking, oh, that's true just because it looks that way. So this is used as an example to help us get into a subtler understanding. So it's a very basic and obvious idea on the surface, but it's helping key you into a subtler idea later. The reflection is given as a simile to help us understand the emptiness of other objects, such as a table. Someone could make the syllogism, the table does not exist as it appears, for an example like a reflection. The example, the reflection of a face is empty of being a real face, is coarse. The point it is illustrating, the emptiness of inherent existence of the table, is subtle. The example itself cannot be the subtle emptiness, because if it were, we would have to have already realized emptiness just to understand the example. The table is empty of existing as it appears, like the reflection of a face in the mirror does not exist as it appears. It only says it doesn't exist as it appears, which is a fact. Only that is said because there are multiple levels on which the reflection of a face in a mirror does not exist as it appears. Thus, even if a person has not yet realized the subtle one, he can get at it by contemplating the coarser level indicated by the simile. If a mirage were actually water, as we came closer to it, we would see the water ever more clearly. Wild creatures believe it is water and go running toward it, but as they approach, the appearance of water vanishes because, in fact, there is no water. Dependent on the combination of sunlight and asphalt, an appearance arose of what from a distance seems to be water. Similarly, if we do not analyze closely, inherent existence appears. But the more we investigate, the more we discover it is not actually there. Like a mirage, the appearance of inherent existence is an illusion 
that does not persist if we look closely. Similarly, when the sky is clear on a full moonlight, the form of the moon will appear reflected in a still body of water, though there is no moon in the water as there appears to be. Likewise, things are not existent from their own side as they appear, because if they were, when we searched for them in their basis of designation, we would find them. So from a worldly perspective, we already understand this distinction. Now we're going to go into looking at the two types of views of the transitory collection. There is the intellectually acquired one and the innate one, which is more related to the root of samsara. Let's look at the intellectually acquired view of the transitory collection first. Let's say that you think about how the self exists, or maybe you read a book in which it says that the self exists inherently. You read this book and you begin to think, I exist inherently because it says in this book, and you hold that it is the case, then that is an intellectually acquired view of the transitory collection. So in an intellectually acquired view of this type, you hold that you exist either inherently or you are self-sufficient, substantially existent, and that you hold that based on some reasoning or some statements that you find in books, etc. That is an intellectually acquired type. Not all sentient beings have this. This is not the root of cyclic existence. It is a view of the transitory collection. The innate view of the transitory collection is slightly different. From time without beginning, we have been subject to this grasping that holds both our own selves and other phenomena as self-sufficient, capable of standing alone. When we observe other things, then we have been subject to this grasping which holds both myself and other phenomena somehow are capable of supporting themselves and standing alone or existing inherently. We become very habituated to this, so that we also have an innate, you may say, instinctual grasping, which focuses on the I in your own continuum and holds it to be self-sufficient, substantially existent, or holds it to exist inherently. That is an innate view of the transitory collection. We have this type of view in our continuum, and we may not realize it, in the sense that we don't actually assert I exist in this way, or you may not assert in this way, but you may still have innate grasping within your continuum. This type of misapprehension, which is innate or instinctual, exists in the continuum of all samsaric sentient beings, including birds and wild animals, no matter how big or small it is. Samsaric beings necessarily have this in their continuum. So this is something that we've talked about before, but it's important to remember that there are layers upon layers upon layers, and that all of us samsaric beings have this deeply innate grasping at the self, grasping at the view of the transitory collection, that sees this I as kind of spontaneously arisen or self-creating, that there are parts or facets of it that we made all by ourselves, or we chose or decided independent of anything else. And then on top of that is all our other associations. And then on top of that, it can also be intellectually acquired problems, like maybe religious, like maybe psychological, like maybe superstitious, maybe trauma-based. So looking at the layers upon layers is really key, but the root of the root is the most important to understand in terms of the spiritual development. The coarser levels, of course, are very important in terms of having more everyday happiness and more everyday peace of mind. So from the Lam Rim Chenmo by Lama Tsongkhapa, the stages by which you enter that reality are as follows. So the reality, which is that all things are empty of inherent existence. First, having contemplated in dismay the faults and disadvantages of cyclic existence, which of course is rooted in the type of ignorance we've been talking about, you should develop a wish to be done with it. This is renunciation. 
the determination to be free. Then, understanding that you will not overcome it unless you overcome its cause, you research its roots, considering what might be the root cause of cyclic existence. You will thereby become certain from the depths of your heart that the reifying view of the perishing aggregates, or ignorance, acts at the root of cyclic existence. You then need to develop a sincere wish to eliminate that. Next, see that overcoming the reifying view of the perishing aggregates depends upon developing the wisdom that knows that the self, as thus conceived, does not exist. You will then see that you have to refute that self. Be certain in that refutation, relying upon scriptures and lines of reasoning that contradict its existence and prove its non-existence. This is an indispensable technique for anyone who seeks liberation. After you have thus arrived at the philosophical view that discerns that the self and that which belongs to the self lack even a shred of inherent nature, you should accustom yourself to that. This will lead to the attainment of the embodiment of truth, the wisdom realizing emptiness. Summary. Regarding the ignorance that is the root of samsara, this is the first link in the 12 links of dependent arising. This type of ignorance is strong enough to drive actions that place complete karmic seeds, able to project a whole new rebirth. This is not intellectually acquired ignorance. It is not the mental factor of ignorance that is broader and can not know or know incorrectly many things. One can have this type of ignorance while being able to tell the difference between real and unreal conventional phenomena. Some lower tenet schools believe the ignorance that is the root of samsara is grasping at the aggregates or phenomena is the problem. Middle way consequence school says, while grasping at the aggregates, phenomena precedes grasping at the self, grasping at the self must be overcome first. Then one will easily release grasping at the aggregates, phenomena. The antidote to the first link ignorance, the root of samsara, is the wisdom realizing the emptiness of inherently existent self and phenomena. This is the middle way consequence school view. To achieve this wisdom, we must understand the very subtlest mistake in our instinctual thinking. What is the flaw in our way of understanding our own identity? In other words, what is the object of negation, refutation? Inherently existent self. An identity that is self-existent and self-arising and doesn't need to be labeled or introduced to be known. That is independent and self-perpetuating. While we all have unique personalities and traits, we didn't make them and they weren't built into our nature from the beginning, or a core of meanness. This type of self doesn't exist at all, even conventionally. It is empty of existing in this way. Realizing this perceptually and directly first requires deep conceptual thought and logical inferences, as well as mental momentum to fuel our understanding. There is a self, it's just not that one.
So I hope that's starting to make sense. I think it would be really useful if you reread the section on the root of samsara from How Things Exist. It's pages 80 to 83. And then there's more about the difference between mistaken and wrong, pages 93 to 95. So have a look at that, and we'll talk about it next week. Bye.